All righty. Welcome, everyone. I hope you're in the right room. If you're looking for the Running for Office How and Why event, you're at the right place. My name is Yahira Ortega, and I'm the Policy and Advocacy Associate for Thrive Alliance. We're so excited to present to you this event. Um, our co-sponsor here is Leadership Council San Mateo. And along with Thrive, we will be talking and chatting with local elected members of our county. And before we begin, we're excited to announce that we're offering Spanish interpretation for this event. You can click the globe icon and click on the Spanish feature on the right hand side. Si necesita acceder a la interpretación de en español, haga el clic en el icono del globo. Next, please enable the Zoom live transcript feature. You have to click the more option to enable it here, as you can see. So you go down to the bottom and you click more and then live transcript should be enabled. Finally, I would like to introduce Margie Power, the co-president of Leadership Council San Mateo. Thank you, Yahaira. Welcome everyone. We are going to start with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that our office operates on the ancestral homeland of the Raimeutush Ohlone tribes past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. As organizations that are dedicated to advancing equity, practicing empathy, and understanding each other's differences, we aspire to show appreciation, respect, and concern for all connected to this land. We also acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous peoples, and we gratefully recognize our history. So good afternoon, my name is Margie Power. I'm co-president of Leadership Council San Mateo County. And we are thrilled to be partnering with Thrive Alliance on this event today. We are a countywide cross-sector leadership development organization that believes communities are stronger when a diversity of leaders are connected, knowledgeable, and targeted in their efforts to create positive change. We inspire, connect, and educate both established leaders and emerging leaders from all three sectors to positively transform our county and find solutions to our biggest issues facing our communities. We elevate and empower countywide leadership talent, and it's really important to us that our leadership of our county represents the diversity of the people who live and work here. Um, next slide, please. So what we offer are two immersion programs. One is leadership core program for senior leaders. And we're proud to have Antonio Lopez in the class this year. And Amarant Lee has been a speaker for our program this year. So I'm very grateful to them both. And we have also an emerging leaders program which we will be launching this fall. Applications for both programs are available in early March next week. So keep your eye out for those. And then we also offer professional development events and also um, in information events. For example, we're having a candidate forum for Don Horsley's district, uh, April 21st. And then we have an empower your team professional development training on April 22nd. And the reason why we are so excited to be partnering um, with Thrive on this, this important um, how to run for office and why event is that we need people who are willing to step into the arena and lead. And you may not feel like you have all the information or you have all the skills, but just if you have an inkling that you have something to offer and you have uh, a, a unique perspective or lived experience that can add to the voices at the table, that's what we need. We need more people stepping up and my co-president, Karen Hardy, and I have both served in elective office, and we know how it can feel really scary to jump in, but also the biggest personal growth opportunity and a wonderful opportunity to serve the community. So thank you so much for being here today. I will pass it over to Petra.
I'll do that again. Hi, I'm Petra Silton. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Education for Thrive Alliance. Um, Thrive is the Alliance of Nonprofits for San Mateo County. We strengthen people, organizations, and communities through capacity building, through cross-sector collaboration, and through policy and advocacy. Next slide. Um, some of our programs right now, uh, you see here Wellness Wednesdays for, for nonprofit staff. Um, because we know how tough this has been for everyone. We have children and education uh, working group, as well as doing a lot of COVID outreach. But the main reason why we're here today is on our next slide, which is our civic education programs. So Thrive has been involved in many ways on civic education. Um, we were very involved in making sure that nonprofits voices were represented in the redistricting discussions. Since the Voters' Choice Act in 2017, we've been working on voter education and outreach, specifically making sure that the elections office hears from the most underrepresented people through connections with nonprofits. We have monthly meetings and anybody is welcome to come um, and express your thoughts about the voter outreach that the elections office is doing, as well as coordinate with other organizations that are doing elections outreach. This year Thrive is going to do something new. We're going to put together an elections education toolkit. So anybody can take the toolkit, bring it to your organizations, give it to other people to share um, because elections are complicated and there's a lot to learn. And we wanna make sure that that information is easily accessible and that information will be translated as well. Um, and then which brings us to running for office. Why are we doing this? Why does Thrive do this? So, San Mateo County is 47% people of color, but our elected representatives are much lower percentage. Um, one of the worst actually in the Bay Area as far as how our electeds, our, our electeds track to our population. So we'd like to make sure that that changes. And so we want to demystify the process of running for office. We also know that policy change is really the best way to make change. And policy change comes from elected officials. And if they represent the community, um, we'll be more likely to be able to make real progress. So hopefully this event can help encourage more engagement at all levels, boards, commissions, school boards, city council, all the way up. So with that, I'd like to, um, to give this back to Yahaira. Yahaira is going to talk to us a little bit about the mechanics of running for office. And then after that, we'll go to our excellent pin. Alrighty, so just a quick reminder, if you just came in, we are excited to announce that we're offering interpretation in Spanish and the way to access it is you click on the globe icon down below and then click on the Spanish feature. Si necesita acceder a la interpretación en español, haga el clic en el icono de globo. Next, we are also offering the live transcript feature. So you click the more option down below and click on the live transcript feature here. Alrighty, now let's get into the logistics. So today I'll be covering on how to actually run for office. Um, but before I begin, please pull out your phone with your camera and scan this QR code on the right hand side. It should take you to smcvote.org and we will also post that in the chat. Once you reach that chat, once you reach the site, if you scroll down, you'll see an option to view the candidate guide. It should look like the image on the screen. In this guide, you will find details about how to file for your candidacy. On the right of my screen, you will find contacts for this office. Feel free to contact Jim, Hillary, or Michelle with any of your questions. In the following slides, I will go over on how to file important dates and and other important information. Great, now let's talk about how do you actually file? So the election office is offering two methods to file. 
You can now file online or in person. Due to the pandemic, they have expanded their services to accommodate those who might want to file online. If you want to file online, you need to provide the election office with a written request to receive the candidate filing documents electronically, and they will send you a PDF form. Once your PDF form is all completed, you have to print all the completed forms and mail them in or drop them in at the elections office. Now let's say you wanna file in person. Be sure to make an appointment in advance to file documents and to take the oath. Whether you're filing electronically or in person, the election office recommends the following. If you need help, do not hesitate to reach out to them, schedule a phone call or video conferencing chat. Secondly, all oaths must be executed in person or via online video conferencing. And lastly, avoid the last minute crowds and make your appointments in advance. Now let's move on to important dates. So as you can see, we're currently in the candidate filing period, which will end on Friday, March 11th at 5 p.m. Please note that all city candidates should obtain and file documents at their city clerk's office. And then we have the extended candidate filing period, which extends through March 16th. So if an eligible incumbent does not file nomination documents by 5 p.m. on March 11th, the filing period is extended for that office until March 16th for any person other than the incumbent. Then you can see we will begin the write-in candidate filing period. So for all write-in candidates must obtain paperwork to file all paperwork and other required filing documents between these dates. So that would be between Monday, April 11th and Tuesday, May 24th. Next, a key date here is Monday, May 9th because early voting period starts on this day. And four days prior to election day, all vote centers will open. And the last day to vote is Tuesday, June 7th. So again, all this information is on smcvote.org. Please do not hesitate to reach out to the people in the elections office here or myself for clarification. I'm going to drop my email in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Yahira. Really appreciate just the basic mechanics, very important. Um, I am so excited about the astounding, outstanding panel we have. I chose them, asked them, and I'm very grateful that they said yes to join us for this panel because they all have one thing in common, which is they haven't been in office very long. So I wanted to hear about their journeys. How did they get there? Everyone has a unique story, and I wanted them to have the opportunity to share their story so that hopefully within these four different people with their very different stories, you can see something of yourself or be inspired or get ideas. Um, so our, our uh, panelists today, our special guests, are uh, the City of San Mateo Council Member, Amaranth Lee, San Mateo Union High School District Trustee, Ligia Andrade Zuniga, San Mateo County Community College District Trustee, Lisa Petrides, and East Palo Alto Council Member, Antonio Lopez. So what we're going to do is hear from each of them, what their personal stories are. And then after that, we'll have a discussion and we will be taking questions from the chat. So let's start with Lichia. Do you wanna tell us your story? How did you get here? Sure, thank you. Hi everyone, hola, buenas tardes. Um, my name is Ligia Andrade Zuniga. I am, uh, this is my, I'm going on my second year um, at the Cemetery Union High School District as a trustee. Um, I really came to this position um, after very extensive uh, experiences working in nonprofits and um, in just civic engagement. Um, early on in my life, I was always really into social justice. Um, I started out um, on the uh, San Mateo County um, Commission on the Status of Women, 
and also um, on the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Coalition Board of Directors when it was uh, uh, the Teen Pregnancy Coalition. Now it's called uh, Health Connected. Um, I started doing all of that uh, because my focus was really to empower young women of color um, and make sure that there was a pathway to get involved in a lot of these things because typically um, our voices, our representation is not included for different reasons. Um, in 2009, I became, uh, I, had a, I had a car accident and I ended up with a spinal cord injury. So I'm paralyzed actually from my chest down, um, which catapulted me into disability justice. But a lot of the um, experiences that I had before with um, being involved in, um, in civic engagement really helped me to um, get involved in disability justice and just see all of the intersection um, in our communities. Uh, this, the disabled community is one of the largest minority communities in the world. Um, we are the, one of the communities that is the most intersected because we have so many different um, cultures, experiences, um, ethnicities within one uh, culture. We really, um, we really try to um, encourage and embrace disability culture and disability pride in a lot of the work that we do. So it, um, again, it really intersects everything and gives us representation and a voice because people with disabilities, the percentages of people um, in office and of any, of any sort and even in any type of commissions, boards, committees is very, very small. And so it's really important as you know, as you all may know that representation is one of the most important things. And so making sure that we have that voice was really important to me. Um, and so when I saw the opportunity to be able to make change, especially for young people, um, since we are you know, helping them to become our future leaders and also to have them see themselves in the leadership that we have um, was really important. So that's why I decided to run um, for the school board position. I have two, uh, two children that went through the district. Um, and so as a parent, I was really involved in, um, in the schools. And so now it's at a different level, but I did see some things that needed to be changed. Um, and then I also serve on different boards and commissions throughout the state of California, like the State Independent Living Council, um, and also um, different local things like the San Mateo County Commission on Disabilities, um, the Health Commission, things like that. Um, it really comes full circle. Um, again, like I said, youth are really important to me and making sure that they see themselves in us is really important. So um, that is what I ran. So um, I also want to incorporate a lot of um, people that are not represented like people in the Latinx community, um, especially our immigrant communities um, and just across the board, anybody that, that is underserved and underrepresented. So um, thank you. So that's pretty much my story. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And thank you for all the service you do for the community. Now let's hear from Ammo. Well, thank you so much, Petra. And um, I, I always kind of want to roll back to the origin of my family because I feel like my, my family story plays a big part in um, how I came to be on council. And um, I have a really funny, unique family experience. Um, so unique that the police would regularly um, be called to our house because there were so many people living in my house that they couldn't figure out how we were all related. So they thought we were running a rooming house. So um, I come from a multicultural family. My, um, my dad is Chinese, born in Hawaii. My mom is Jewish. I was, um, my godmother, who's black, lived with us. My god sister, who's black and Brazilian, lived with us. And we had numerous exchange students. And I also have five adopted sisters, and I'm the oldest of eight. So when we talk about sort of like the big tent um, that was the big tent was my my table growing up <laughs> and um, and 
And I think that that's really important because it's been a formative, um, you know, a formative experience and a thread in, in how I approach my leadership and, and, the, um, and the work that I do in community. Um, when, I, um, when my family hit hard times and we were struggling, I was 16 years old and I was working 32 hours a week in high school at a video movie store back when there was VHS and, um, and a bakery. And, um, and I lived in public housing. So uh, for me, it's very personal when we talk about policy and the, the importance of good policy, because it is good public policy that put a roof over my head and stabilized my life so that I could ultimately go to college. I ended up um, getting a great job at UNICEF in Beijing, where I did um, international public health um, right on the front lines of the HIV AIDS um, pandemic. And I'm a two-time nonprofit executive and startup founder. Um, and so I, you know, I, I really do believe that my, my lived experience is about transformation and transforming the struggle and the need to heal in a very personal way um, uh, and doing that through service and my service to community um, and really trying to execute against a vision that I hold for my future and my children's future. And, um, and all that being said, you know, it was funny, I never ever saw myself on council. I mean, there had never been anyone like me. There had never been um, an Asian woman uh, at, uh, on city council in 126 years. And, um, and I always saw myself as the woman behind the woman. I was like, I'm the, you know, I'm the background person. I'm supporting from the, from, from the back and, the, and council and, and elected office, that's not for people like me. That was the, that was the belief that I truly held. Um, and it was, it was really shifted. It shifted when somebody was tapping me to run for school board. And one of my sisters and comrades, Noelia Corzo, um, you know, I was looking at her and I was like, it's not me, it's you. And I ran her campaign and we um, beat all the odds and she was elected. And at the time she was the youngest um, to be elected in San Mateo County and, um, and brought a, a voice to her work on the school board that never um, had existed before. And she's been a, a really important driver in equity issues. Um, and so in 2019, when a vacancy appeared um, or came up on council, she turned around and said, okay, Ammo, it's your turn. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, no, 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 I'm the woman from behind. Like, you know, that's not me. I'm, I'm creating space. I'll be the container. You know, we'll see who, who surfaces and I'll support that person. And really it took her um, convincing me and saying, you know, not only can you do this, but we do need you to do this. And you bring a unique perspective and a lived experience that has not been represented in this community and it's time. And, you know, when you talk about being of service, it does require you to step up and embody um, and pay forward the privilege that you have to have overcome and triumphed over your struggles. So that was a very powerful message and I heard it and I do feel a true debt that I'm paying in the work that I do, um, forged in the fire and, um, and trying as best as I can to, you know, to put the struggle that I went through um, into the work that I do so that other people don't have to struggle so hard. Um, and other people have a chance to, to be uplifted by their communities. So that's my story. Thank you. Definitely hearing a theme of service here. Um, Antonio. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. Excuse me, it's been a long morning for me. Um, it's such a pleasure to see you all virtually. I want to thank you all, whether you're a longtime public servant or somebody really thinking about it. Um, I just want to thank you for taking space to, to learn with us. It really is, it takes a village. Um, and I hope that whatever wisdom that I and we impart helps to channel your own brilliance that is just waiting to come to the surface and really make a change. My name is Antonio Lopez. I'm a council member here for the city of East Palo Alto. And similar to what Emma was saying, you know, I've 
growing up, I didn't really think of myself in politics. My folks are working class immigrants from Mexico. My dad's been a, a waiter, server, dishwasher for most of his life. My mom worked at Orchard, which now is Ace, um, doing paint department. So anything that comes to latex, wax, Venetian, she's your girl. Um, so I don't come from that cloth of public service, but I think kind of what this panel shows is that just by living in San Mateo County, going through the adversity and struggles that we have, we become de facto public servants, whether it's translating court documents, whether it's being at parent-teacher conferences, we're just in order to survive in this county, we've had to advocate for each other. So I consider in some ways, I thought the work I did in council was sort of this big fissure, but really I'm finding it an extension of what I, of my life's work so far of, of, of poetry, of education, of uh, bringing people together. You know, you look at the division that's happening all around the country and we need, we need to find a common ground for us to go past our differences. So in terms of my story, you know, I think people got to understand that I didn't have this desire of politics. I was living in East Palo Alto. I was really focused on education. My, my folks coming from Mexico were saying, you know, education is the most important thing. And that's going to help, uh, that's going to help you to move up the social ladder. And so for most of my, um, la for the last eight years from when I went from East Palo Alto, went to this uh, K through eight education. And you can imagine this was the, the early, early 2000s, mid to the late ones. And so EPA was still struggling through that time, which we still are. But in many respects, um, I found myself really just focusing on hitting the books. Um, I did not have aspirations to run for office. Uh, but what, what had happened was that um, I had gone to college, right? I had gotten a scholarship to go to uh, Menlo School coming from East Palo Alto. And it just, it really, at the age of 14, y'all gotta, gotta understand, like, I didn't even have a mustache. And going from East Palo Alto to Atherton, realizing like how much disparity this, this, this county has, I, I don't think it's like, I put on my shoes and said, I'm gonna be a civic leader. It's like, I've been put in situations where I've had to advocate for myself and my community. And like also to debunk stereotypes and misperceptions, right? Where I go to certain parts of the county and Latinos are mowing lawns or are in the service industry. And how many of us are actually breaking barriers? You know, I see Ron Gonzalez here. He was the first Latino supervisor, right? In the county, right? So it's like, we're literally making our history right now. And so I think for me, it was sort of this moment that I'm not, my lineage and my community is very much still emerging as a leader. Um, and that's something that at first intimidated me, but then there was this beautiful upshot and plus side that I've begun to realize being in public service. Um, so I went to Menlo, kind of was baptized in the fire, really uh, started to see poetry and literature and the storytelling, telling my story, the story of these Palo Alto, the story of this, first gen kid trying to just get his education, right? I wasn't thinking about politics. I was just thinking about how can I get the best education for me? And then I go to Duke University um, through the help of my college counselor, through the help of just my teachers. And really I'm indebted to educators, really. That's so much of my journey. Um, and I left in 2012 East Palo Alto and I was gone for eight years, right? I went to a four year undergrad then I did my, edu my, my poetry MFA at Rutgers University. Then I got a scholarship to study at Oxford, right? So I've been gone from the county for most of my grown man life, right? And so you can imagine my reverse culture shock almost that I go to these prestigious universities and I affirm my parents' faith that this thing called school can uplift us and EP and people and I come back in the middle of a global pandemic. And a lot of the issues that I grew up with are still happening. And people are literally vacating their homes in droves. Neighbors that I met got their bags and furniture up in front. People in EP are getting sick left and right because it's mostly essential work, what we call now essential workers. And so there's sort there was sort of this um slap of face in reality. I'm enjoying these scholarships, these accolades, these personal achievements I've been able to acquire through most of my life through hardship, but I felt as if the city had not risen to that same level. And in particular, young people like myself didn't really feel a part of the system. They really, we don't have a youth commission. We didn't have opportunity. I didn't really see young people come out in the forefront. My predecessor, Laura, Mar Laura Martinez, right? We, we sort of go in, but go out. And what I was really concerned with is that 
this work of young people, is it sustainable? I don't want it to just be these one and dones like myself. What is our succession plan as a county, as a community? And so to be honest with you all, like I hadn't run before and I started thinking about it because I had come back from Oxford and really just wanted to get to work and to really show people, it doesn't matter how many degrees you have or don't have, how many, how many planning commissions you've attended, it just takes heart. And I'll never forget when I was in the campaign trail and I did mostly door knocking. And the way I did it was I just got a bunch of teenage kids, some of them are my cousins, some of them weren't. And we're like, hey, y'all, we're just gonna, we're just gonna learn as we go. We're gonna knock on doors, tell people about first floor leasing. We're gonna tell them about proving our parks, right? Business, helping out businesses and show people that you, we care enough to come to your door and tell you about why you should care about your city. And I think that's hard because a lot of us in EPA, even though we've been a city for 40 years, we felt disfranchised. We felt like the county or the community had not listened to their concerns. And in particular, you have immigrants who are coming in, coming out, people who it's so expensive, a lot, you know, 60% of our city's renters. So how do you create ownership when they don't own much of their environment? I think that's the challenge that we face here in East Palo Alto, particularly our mo as, uh, as Ligia was saying, our most disfranchised immigrant communities, disabled communities, young people, um, children. And I'll never forget on the trail, and I wanna really highlight this point. I was knocking on Saratoga Avenue and uh, we kind of, we knocked on the door and after about a minute, you, we sort of just leave me and my, sort of my number two guy. And uh, an, uh, an African American woman my age kind of peers out and says, hey, you knocked on my door? And uh, she just knew my name immediately. She's like, oh, Antonio, I know who you are. And I was sort of, you know, when someone knows you and you don't know them, it's kind of a bit jarring because you're like, uh, how, do you, how do you know me? And she was giving me some real grueling questions like, okay, what'd you major in? I said, uh, in college, African-American studies. Okay, why'd you major in that? When'd you major in Latino studies? And I said, well, you know, well, they didn't really have it. And also I wanna learn about other cultures and my EPA and all. And all these questions one after another. And then she goes, uh, Antonio, I wanna give you a piece of advice. You don't have to know everything when you run. You, you don't have to act like you got it all together. You don't have to pretend that all the ans all the questions that were volleying at you, the community volleying at you, you're gonna have to know in an instant, right? We see someone like you. We see an investment. We see something, we see someone who is gonna grow to the occasion, to the position. And we understand that that's gonna take some time. And the woman who told me that was Lapria Wilkes. Lapria is the granddaughter of Gertrude Wilkes, one of the, I consider one of the founding members of East Palo Alto as a council, as a leadership. And it meant so much to me that this, um, you know, political pedigree of a person, someone who had who has so much history and name in our city, reminded me that it's not about the accolades or about the stature. It's about the heart and hustle of just, are you gonna be someone who cares enough to take care of the city and, and unify and to really put as much uh, passion even if you don't vote the same way people do, that you're gonna have the best interest of the city at heart. And you know, we 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 had we won by 69 votes at the end of the day. And that's why, I like when young people or people just tell me your vote doesn't count, I'm like, that's a bunch of BS. Cause I can tell you the three or four houses in EPA that got me into this seat. And it's a privilege, but really it was a it was an an accumulation of a mixture of a bit of self-doubt for me of transferring my passion education, but really falling in love with the community. You know, I just wanna finish by saying, I don't think, I don't even think the point is winning or not per se. I think we alluded to it earlier. The point is how you transform in the process and how you learn about your community in the process. You know, when I ran, there were so many issues that I just knew intimately. There's nothing like learning, having a conversation with an older, with an elder on the corner of a street and he's picking fruit and you just spend time learning about his story, people having oxygen tanks and seeing the, the, the sickness and the health people are going through. That, those kinds of impressions, I think really make you as a leader, that they, they, they reinforce in you how urgent, how necessary, how much people uh, need our leadership. And so with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop what I'm saying and thank you everybody for listening to me. I'm probably sure I rambled a couple minutes on it but uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Antonio.
I heard a lot of things from what you said. One was that it takes heart. Another one is it's really good to have lots of cousins. Um, <laughs> Lisa. Great, thank you. I'm so inspired by all of your stories. So my name is Lisa Petrides and I'm a trustee on the San Mateo County Community College District Board. And I never really saw myself as a politician, but rather as a very uh, informed and active citizen. So I'd been involved in organizing efforts and rallies and as an advocate, but I had had an um, a whole career as an educator. I'm a former faculty member and I now run an education nonprofit. So kind of seeing myself as an ordinary person, not a politician, you know, in some ways even a bit cynical about political office as I had been watching what had happened over the last six years or so, you know, I was pretty discouraged. But then, <clears throat> interestingly, as the districting in the county uh, became, so the San Mateo County Community College District, uh, instead of having at-large elections, they broke it up into five districts. And it turned out that the year I ran in 2020 was the first year that they were having this, my, my district was gonna be represented and that's the coast side. So from Pacifica to Pescadero and all the way over to 280 and some other parts of cities there too. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. I'm so committed to the coast. I've lived here for 15 years and I, I care about this community and I work in this community. And friends started sending me and saying, Lisa, you ought to run for this. You know, this has your name all over it. And I'm like, I'm an educator, I'm not a politician. And so it's not a good time for me. My, my mother was not well. I mean, there were so many things happening. But as I started to think about it and you know, the, the mission of the community college and who it represents, so aligned with my own family, my um and the family of Greek immigrants. The, you know, the village my grandmother came from, the girls didn't even go to school past grade three or four. Um, it was just, I had really worked my whole life. Education was so important to my family. It was like, you do this. And it was such a passion. It wasn't even a choice. It was really a passion. It was just like, this is what we'll do to, you know, to thrive and, and become who we are. So as I looked at, into it, um, you know, further, I thought, all right, I guess I could do this. You know, I could leverage my experience in a different way than I had been all these years. So instead of being, you know, in an organization or doing research or doing training, I thought, well, I could I could up my game. You know, I could step into this in a different way. So I still had a little bit of ambivalence about was it the right time? Was this the right move for me? Uh, and I stumbled across the organization called Wire. Uh, which was uh, founded about maybe about four or five years ago to address uh, gender equity in politics. And I started going to some of their workshops and trainings. And, you know, I, I made that first call. And by the way, if you don't want to be convinced, <laughs> don't call them because they are so persuasive. And we're just like, you have to run, you have to run. If, and, and they had done some research on my district and said, you know, there's no, if, if you don't run, you could have a whole board of, of men on that, you know, on that district. And, um, you know, we absolutely have to have more women just step up. You, you have everything you need. I really kind of re uh, resonated with what Antonio said. You know, you don't need any special credentials or expertise. You just really take what you have and you, and you bring it there. And that's, that's enough. And, um, you know, so it just really seemed to me that being a good citizen was about stepping up at this point. And it wasn't gonna, I couldn't just any longer kind of cheer for others and, you know, organize on the side. I think we all have actually an obligation. I've been convincing so many other people to run for office. Maybe some of you are on this call today, I hope. Um, but I also learned that being on the governance side is really quite different. Um, you know, in some ways, like I said, I was a little cynical about imagining what kind of impact you could really have in the governance side uh, of a big community college district. But I realized that even the smallest changes in policy really can impact students' lives, you know, from underrepresented communities and dreamers and unhoused students and foster youth. These are the people that are, uh, are re you know, reaching up into their potential through community college and education. So, you know, on that positive side, uh, that, 
you know, the, um, the mag these, might, these small kind of micro changes can have a huge impact. And, and I think that's been something that over my 14 months in office that I've, I've really seen. And then just also working across the community uh, in ways, oops, there's my five minutes, uh, working across the communities has been working with trade organizations and the unions and housing and the people who are doing a lot of fabulous work around food scarcity. You know, all of a sudden I'm, I'm seeing how education is, you know, it's embedded into all aspects of, of how a community moves forward and thrives and, and, and reaches its potential. So um, working across now the county, not just in education has been uh, an amazing experience. And you do come with everything that you have and is also a steep learning curve. Uh, and that's you know, part, of, part of the challenge. And part of, I think, again, I'm gonna echo what Antonio said is that you, know, you come into this as a leader to also grow um, yourself and to help grow your community. And so thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I want to pick up on two things that you said. First of all, one of the things that made you feel empowered to run was just knowing that because the community college is now a by-district election, that you had a smaller area to represent. And there are so many cities and school districts that are changing to by-district elections which means two things. One, that hopefully it will be easier because you have a smaller area to represent, but also we need to make sure there are candidates for all of those places. So this is going to be very important to make sure there are candidates. So thank you, Lisa, for bringing that, bringing that up. Um, and hopefully that'll encourage more people to feel like it is easier to run because you, that your territory is much smaller. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to uh, take from what you had just said was the impact. You talked about the impact you've managed to have in the last 14 months. 14 months is not a long time and to feel that you have impact must be fantastic. I'd love to hear from the other panelists how they feel. Have you been able to accomplish, you know, running for office is exciting and then you're in office. Have you felt like you've been able to accomplish things? Have you felt like you may have made an impact? And um, why don't we go back and start with Likia again? Sure, thank you. Yes and no. <laughs> I'm, it's so new, right? So I've only been in office for a year, so I still have a lot to do. But I have seen a larger representation and involvement of our students and of people that haven't typically been heard. And that was one of my priorities when I was running was to get more, uh, more of our students involved in the policies that we're passing, in um, the decisions that we make, and just being comfortable enough to even like understand what the board meetings are all about. That's another issue that we have is that, yeah, we can, um, we can invite people all we want, but we don't all speak the same language. And it's not just a cultural thing. It, well, no, it is a cultural thing because I really, I really think that a lot of the language that we use within our um, like political worlds and our um, governing worlds do not translate well to our, our communities, period. Um, a lot of students, like especially with our um, student board members, some of them were asking me like, I don't even know how to read the agenda. You know, that's a problem um, because people are not gonna want to be involved if they don't understand. Um, it's just, it's not, um, it's not something that, it's not that they're not interested, it's that it's confusing. Um, so in that sense, that's still a work in progress, but there are some things, and even with our racial equity policies and um, some more representation, like I was saying, um, more, more exposure and visibility of people like um, Peninsula High School, um, like our ELD students, um, like um, students that um, don't, uh, students that are in um, our disability world. Um, we need to really make sure that uh, we are engaging more people. So like I said, in that sense, I do feel like I'm making an impact because I've seen it and the connections that we've been making with our students in speaking out and, and telling us what they need 
um, that's really important to me as well. And I do feel like I'm making some traction on that. So, um, so again, yes and no. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, um, Emil. Yeah, I, I'll borrow Lihia's answer, yes and no. I think for me, the, um, the question of impact is sort of like immediate and long-term. And for a lot of our community needs that are so critical that, you know, they needed support a decade ago, right? And so it can't ever come soon enough. And the, the wheels of government turn so incredibly slowly. And so there are there are things, you know, that jump out to me, like, you know, projects that I was working on well before I was on the council, like, for example, getting, um, you know, getting 225 affordable housing units built on a parking lot um, downtown San Mateo. Um, so turning our public land into affordable housing, that is an incredible accomplishment that is to the credit of our city and council and leadership and community. However, it's not a solution for people who are housing insecure today. Right, and the thousands of people that have already been displaced. So there's that frustration for me always, you know, just in terms of, you know, how do, how do you measure impact when, when you see the need is so great and, um, and a lot of the solutions that, that we are involved in will take so much time for, um, for you know, them to actually be felt. There are, on the other hand, things that I think have been more immediate that have been driven by the pandemic, like street closures, um, and and you know reclaiming public space um, from you know from cars and giving it back to people and businesses, which um, which has really changed the you know changed the the landscape of our downtown very significantly in the experience of our downtown, and that happened in a pretty quick period. But it's never you know a, a perfect fix. You know, like we sacrificed ADA parking for that to happen, and are trying to resolve those things. Right, we. We have a lot of um, different kinds of businesses downtown. It's not like we're all restaurants. So a lot of our, you know, our retail businesses that are not um, in service and restaurant, you know, they they are suffering and and paying a, a price for those decisions. So it's not ever going to be a perfect solution. And I think that you know when we talk about the the impact and the and the re very real trade offs that our community experiences, there's always sort of a bittersweetness. So Antonio, yes and no, or yes or no? Yes with no, you know, like it's not and, it's it's sort of, it, there's a catch. Like if you want something quick, go to the private sector. We have a lot of places in the Bay Area that you can have a corporate meeting, get it done, and like, but democracies are slow and democracies are frustrating and democracies have a lot of problematic things because guess what? People are just problematic. And we grew up with the same biases, the same prejudices, the same divisions, right? East Palo Alto, you would think that a city like mine would be unified given the fact, given its unique location, where in my lifetime, you have a, a, a house that's lower, less than 100,000 and I was upwards of a million, where you remember public safety being the most paramount issue. And now people are like literally going hand in fist to come and live here. There's been an enormous amount of cataclysmic change in my city. And with it comes the beauty of diversity of different opinions where you have homeowners, renters, the historic African-American population, a rising Latino demographic where they are now the majority. And so for me, part of making change is figuring out what my, what my role has been on this council and on these political council and in the community right, as the person who sort of became the new kid on the block and with my two respective incumbents, you know, on the one hand, I'm here to shake things up and say that young people need to be more involved in office and we have to be more robust as a city. You know, I frankly believe that East Palo Alto has had to take the burden of being, afford of being affordable at the expense of our economic infrastructure, at the expense of our businesses, right? A city has to be robust in all its services it provides. And we don't have a community services department. And I don't say that to, um, or a parks and rec, right? We, and so what are the gaps to fill? And more importantly, if it's just the same cluster of people leading, that's not actual civic change. It involves inviting more people to the table. So sort of like what Lisha and Emma were saying, how do people see themselves in us? And which communities can feel emboldened to now be more involved by virtue of just being there, just breathing, just going through the motions, the civic literacy 
was is so important and figuring out what's an RFP, what's a notice of funding agreement, how do you read an agenda, right? Um, figuring out what clo closed session meetings, what, what has been going on in, in the city. And, you know, I also have to sort of remind people that this game called politics is pretty rough. And how are we supporting people? Once our people get there, you know, it kind of sort of reminds me when you'd have the diversity weekends in colleges and the administration would like do everything to get the black brown kids there. And then once you're there, it's like, all right, have fun. It's like, wait a minute, like you don't just stop supporting me. And we can't just expect people to be superhero films and just figure it out. We need our communities to help us out. That doesn't mean like vote in lockstep, but it means that like we're people doing this on our volunteer time. And we have families, we have things going on in the background. Um, I was almost almost about to lose our home here where I live, where I figured out where I was gonna live. And you know, we don't say that to find to find pity, but just to say that we're we're just complicated human beings and trying to um, figure out what your position is. So for me, it was really trying to unify my city when there's so much change, socioeconomic communities, different white Asian communities. Um, Latino demographics rising, a lot of that causes anxiety in people. And it's not that it's um, problematic or prejudicial. It's more, I think human beings are creatures of habit. And so how do you represent a future where you're included in it, where people don't feel like what they've worked so hard to build is suddenly swept under the rug. So much of our gente has lived in fear. They can't live in possibility. When I ran, the first thing my parents said was, don't run because you'll get in trouble and people will get well, people will um, try to intimidate you. When I got sued, they're like, just give up and you know, give up, go back to normal habits. And so I think so much of our community operates out of fear. And that's why we don't run for office because we're afraid once, how can we actually sustain it? And there's a part of me that kind of has that, but then I'm like, there's so much, there is so much at stake. Fear is not, fear is not helpful or necessary. It's, it's going to be in the back seat or in the passenger seat, but I have to have faith that the little work that I've done so far, trying to diversify Sequoia Union District, trying to get getting our library here in East Palo Alto that's been, you know, old for about 40 years, um, greater vaccine distribution. I thank Senator Becker and others in Canapa that have really took the lead last year and make sure we're not 85%. There's in the Pacific Islander community, right? There was a tsunami that hit them last month and how are we, East Palo has the largest Pacific Islander community per capita in the US, continental US, aside from Hawaii. So there's a lot of need, a lot of support, and there's room to be fearful. But I, the more and more I'm in this game, I realize like if I have the right people in my corner, fear is not necessary. It's just about having hope that you can make it to the, take it one meeting at a time, one agenda item at a time. And having conversations like this to just be honest about how tough it is and still that, rise to the occasion. That brings me to very, very nicely to the question when you're talking about being fearful of this is do um, maybe Lisa, you can start answering. Did you have a mentor? Did you have someone who had your back and who told you what this was going to be like? Yeah, yes, yes and no. I mean, in, in some ways I had, you know, a dozen or so mentors in some of these communities like the WIRE community, for example. Um, but I think in some way, so absolutely, you need people you can just go and ask questions. And I was also just amazed at the people who are in political office, how willing they were also to sort of mentor and say, have you run up to the, you know, have you run into this kind of craziness around endorsements where people are like, are, you know, threatening each other over what they'll do or won't do for you if they endorse you, because you need endorse you know, you need endorsements to run so that people know who you are and so that somebody who they know thinks well of you. So there's 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 so many things to um, to be navigating, and you know, in in some ways. Uh, you just look around and there are people who will help you at the same time this sort of like there's there's not necessarily someone who has your back I feel like you're having to really the community has your back in some ways but you have to be just sort of self-motivated to keep going and just say what is it that you're focusing on and for me it was really very simple because I just thought about 
you know, the student is first, you know, these people that we're talking about in our communities, if they don't have an education, like we're sort of, we're sort of like the beginning of the pipeline, we're not the answer to all the problems in the community, but if we can't even get young people into the pipeline, you know, we're, we're, we're so far behind. So when you just, so for me, focusing on something sort of a very narrow, you know, it's the eye on the prize, that's what sort of kind of keeps you going. It isn't necessarily, I mean, it's fabulous to have cheerleaders and, and supporters. And I had a wonderful, I had this amazing group of student um, volunteers uh, who on my campaign, who would, you know, they sort of, they inspired me, you know, cause from week to week, I'd be like, oh, this happened. And like, okay, let's do this, you know and just because they were motivated and they were community college students and wanted to see other, you know, they were very much behind the mission of the community college. So it, I guess sort of mentoring and that guidance and who has your back, it's kind of all around you, you know and you have to just sort of find it and tap into it when you need it. Thanks. Um, Emma or Alicia, did you want to chime in on this? Sure. Um, just like what Lisa was saying, um, I had kind of like a village of mentors. Um, I like to call on people for different things. And I like to, um, I like to like kind of build into people's strengths on how they can help me. But one of the communities that I really, um, really valued as well was our young people. I had people that I could call um, that were in that were students that were, um, you know, maybe just graduated in the district um, to pick their brain because I'm I'm really not that young anymore, and so sometimes I want to think that I'm still like super in touch, but there are things that I'm not in touch with, and I have to admit that. Um, also with my mental health, I had to make sure that I had people I could debrief with um, because there were, you know, there were uh, debates and there were um, stress with deadlines and things like that. And um, also understanding the process. And sometimes we struggle from feeling like the imposter syndrome. And so I had to make sure that I had people that could like reel me back in and say, you know, remember why you're here. Um, but in my community, like even with Emma, like I could call Emma and she'll answer questions for me or let's collaborate on this or what do I do with that? And people like her that, you know, that I can call and get um, assistance from and support. Um, but yeah, like Lisa was saying, there were a ton of people that, um, that were so like gracious and so um, understanding and just wanted to help me, like genuinely wanted to help. So, um, if that is, I think, one of the most important thing to have a mentor base, even if it's just one mentor, but someone to um, keep you on track, to help you with whatever, in, you know, stuff comes up with your, just how you're feeling about everything. Um, but also communities that you don't really think would be um, like a mentorship kind of relationship um, and making sure that you, you just, I guess, speak to the things that you don't know about too. Okay. So speaking of keeping on track, we only have one minute left. So what I would love is for each of you to give us like a one sentence, best political hack or thing you didn't get a chance to say or piece of advice. Um, and who wants to go first? You have one minute, so one minute total. I'll, I'll say um, just stretch, stretch yourself um, and, and know that a lot of your relationships are going to be stretched, but that stretching is, um, it's, it's a sign of growth and change. And so it's, um, that's where the work is and holding those relationships and those bridges with people where you may, you might not agree on everything um, and you still need to stay um, together and maintain that connection point so you can continue to do the work that that's um, that's what leadership and coalition building is about um, is maintaining those bridges and and um, in a way that you know can withstand the stretch <laughs> thanks Lisa um, you know I'm gonna say stay in touch with the joy around your work and why you do it. 
because otherwise you're going to give and give and give until you're burned out. And if you don't have the, you know, this work is hard and it's heavy and people's lives are, you know, are, are impacted in, in so many negative ways today, right? So you have to, you have to have sort of an internal kind of, you know, it's sort of the breath, right? The life, the laughing, you have to find the joy and keep that there or else I think your work becomes just so burdensome that you, you burn out and you can't continue. I want to make a joke about politicians talking too much, but that wouldn't be polite because I'm so loving what everyone is saying. Um, Lithia. Yeah, like uh, relationships matter, they're important. Um, what you're representing is important um, because it's not so much, well, I also would think like thinking outside of the box, like of what, like Emma was saying with stretching, like where are there places or communities or um, just areas that you haven't tapped into? Um, for example, for me, it was like, I thought with COVID, it was gonna be a problem, but it actually helped me because I needed to have that virtual space. Since I have a disability, it's not as easy for me to navigate precinct stuff and you know, uh, fundraiser, fundraisers and things like that. So it really helped me. And I, again, like I had to kind of like think of this differently, the pandemic differently. So, um, yeah. Thank you, Antonio. Yeah, I'll give you one before you run and one after you win. The first one is the one who walks the most wins. That's it. Or however you, you walk or you skateboard, however you figure it out. But the one who travels and gets into the community most, they win. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you're a supervisor or a first-time voter, you're 18, you get the same voting power as the other person. I ran with, had zero endorsements, none of the political cloud. I had just come back from college. I was not a known name in East Palo Alto but I got to know my community and the community will respond positively about that. The second one is when you get into office, don't expect, don't walk to a meeting expecting you're right, right? Mm -hmm. If you have a meeting and you have the opinion and you're gonna be like, I'm gonna hold dogly to my opinion, there's no point in having the meeting because there's no exchange of ideas. It's just an, an assertion of one's opinion. And I don't think we're in the position to be dogmatic. We're in the position to have conviction, but to be open-minded. And if we truly believe in equity, then we have to understand that we, we don't have all the pieces of the puzzle, that we need each other to really understand the nuance of a topic. So that's my two points. Thank you. I am absolutely honored to have had you all on this panel. Um, I really appreciate Leadership Council San Mateo County for co-sponsoring with us. Thank you, Margie and Karen. And I hope we can continue these conversations. Like I wanna see, other people in the room also next time, right? When they're new, newly elected. Um, and I really appreciate how much you all are encouraging other people to run and the support that you got from the community. So thank you also very much for being here and for being a part of it and reach out to us if you want to do any more elections outreach. So thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs>